this recording, record on this computer. Okay. This one's also, so this one is worth a few less points than other ones. So now let me see if I can get it open. Let's see. Oh, I didn't save it, of course. Amazing. Sorry, I set it up last night and I just forgot to check, check the appropriate button because of course I had a, um, because of course I had a, um, yesterday was my kid's birthday, so I was a bit preoccupied. So, visible to students, shows time to assessment 45, hit the save button, there we go. So there we go. So now if I go over here, so you can find the quiz by going over here and clicking this link, which will bring you to the assignment page, which can also be found over here by going and clicking on your little person icon on RuneStone and clicking the assignment page. Okay, so once you click on this, you'll have a time remaining countdown which you can start and you can pause and it will just kind of blank the screen. But once you start it, do not close this tab because then your it will it will lock it. So once it just it will it so once you start it, you need to you know once you start it, basically you got to complete it in one sitting. The sitting should take 45 minutes. If it runs down, if you run out of time. Oh, well, again, keep in mind the late penalty. So it's not a big issue. So you can take whatever time you need on it, but the but there starts to be a late penalty that's a tenth of a point per minute. Is or, there a study guide? Nope. There's no need for a study guide for this one. Uh, I would suggest doing it after you've completed lab two, because that's what all, all this quiz goes over. Um. There's not really a need for the study guide. It's 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 very specifically targeting this over here plus the hit plus the one bit of history I mentioned in the previous lecture. So um it is open note, open book. So you should be at once you start it, you should be able to go to different tabs, right? So just for like sake over here, right? I hit the start button, it says, yeah, if you navigate away from this and you've got different questions, right? So let's see what happens if I go away from this page. Okay, I'm gonna even start and go away to a different window. I'm gonna come back to this. Yeah, it's still going, that's fine. Okay, so again, but the minute we close this, this is where we get, get an issue. So if you close this, right, gives you a warning, it will say, hey, you skipped a bunch of questions. So if something like that happens, send me an email and I will, I'll be able to check your activity to see what happened, okay? So don't try to pull one over on me there. Like, you know, if I, you need, if you want to like see what the questions are first and then accidentally close close it so I can unlock it. Don't don't play that game with me, please. Um, Cause I can actually check everything you do on RuneStone. Um, but if you like, if an accident happens, like you get a power outage or you ask the God, we're working on something and you accidentally close the page, just let me know. I'll reset your quiz for you. Okay. It's not something to be super stressful about. This one is 34 points. Um, later quizzes go up to 100 points. So it's not, again, not something to be super stressed, stressed about. Make sense? Um, this is kind of to introduce you to the kinds of questions that and the way these quizzes work. Now that said, uh, unless you get an email, unless we all get emails, um, unless we all get emails saying that we're that we're we're uh, indeterminately exiled, um, we are expected back in class um, next week. Um, that is the default mode of operation. So that's only going to change if they send an email saying so. So a couple caveats to that. Uh, first, get vaccinated. Seriously, do it. Um, I don't, I'm not a chemist or a bioinformatics. And bioinformatics ain't even my thing. I've taken an advanced, uh, you know, PhD level bioinformatics class, which means that if I wanted to 
burn my time trying to catch up to where everybody else is on coronavirus. I should, certainly could understand the papers, but that's not my thing. And I'm not going to uh, stick my foot in a, in a domain that's best left to biochemists and, and, and those kind of researchers. I know enough to read their papers, though, and know how to, enough about how to interpret their data. Vaccines work. They have worked since we've invented them. Um, like the entire concept of vaccines in general, they've worked. Pretty much every single modern objection to vaccines comes from a very terribly debunked study done by a guy called Andrew Wakefield, which was a which was it's 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 whole travesty of a of an academic paper where nobody bothered checking his references, and then he came out after he published it to then say stuff that he didn't say in the paper, but to use the paper to try to back up the stuff he didn't say in his paper. It was a travesty and it was definitely awful, but seriously, his paper was terrible. And um, it, 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 to the point of getting subjects by bribing children at his kid's birthday party so that he could take their blood. I kid you not, the paper is that bad. Uh, I do not teach W A W S. They just happened to hand this out at um, at a conference at a conference I was um, at, and uh, the shirt's incredibly comfy. Like uh, the free shirt, the free swag that you get at going to conferences or hackathons, they actually are pretty comfortable sometimes. I've got an um, an amazing pair of socks that I love um, that I that I ran into the ground and a couple really good shirts. Also got some really crummy shirts, but you know. You know, they were handing out shirts. I'm happy to do this, but AWS is awesome. You should check it out. Um, and as students, you get to a ton of like free credits to use um, to run your stuff on your on your server. So, hey, going back to vaccines, vaccines work. Um, and, and on the computer science side, okay, how many of you are familiar with folding at home? Okay, this is really impressive to me because this is kind of tangential to where my research actually is. It's an old program, old program. Uh, the idea behind, behind folding at home is that um, there's a ton of computers that just don't do anything, okay? They, they don't do anything. So this, and this has been like, well, before when I was in college that, uh, that I think that basically you, you, you use these things to work, to create a large distributed system to work on problems that the uh, specifically a protein folding problem, this thing simulating the how different proteins move and fold. It's not about like getting money. It's about downloading a piece of program and letting your computer run it. Okay, uh, to solve these biology problems, these extremely important bioinformatics problems like that look, attack that look at cancer, look at um, Alzheimer's, and the way those things work and ever since covid became a thing covid um but one of the things happened when we did when, when a bunch of people were stuck at home sars cov 2 simulations go exascale to cap uh, to capture spike opening and real cryptic profits across the pro proteome i don't this again this is my stuff but i know this this is big that this is the first exascale um come uh, basically basically we created Basically, enough people compu uh, donated computing power just by running this program on their computer that we got an exascale computer. Where that that's basically another level above what Terra, Peta, I forget. I don't. I, I forget my. But exascale was basically the big one. Uh, and it 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 worked really well. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so this was the web page for it. Even cited this in a paper recently. But the idea here is just kind of we can see just how many folding at home users and uh, and the amount of po uh, of power. So the amount of computing power in exaflops, which is floating point operations, uh, they it beat all the supercomputers. So there was a lot of computing power that was do, being thrown at figuring out uh, COVID-19. A lot of research has gone into this. 
So anyway, that's just an aside. Check it out if you're more interested. But again, going back to this, uh, get vaccinated if you haven't been already. Um, I think you have to be at this point. Um, also, wear masks, preferably these things, which are uh, N95s and KN95s. They're good. Um, so last semester was the, basically the first time I ever went to school and did not get sick. That was great. Okay, third thing. Uh, if you are feeling sick, don't come. Send me an email. Uh, first off, if you're if you're uh, if you're feeling sick enough that you can't learn, send me an email and just like you know, tell me that you're not you're 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 not able to attend class. Uh, if you are si feeling sick and unable to attend and able to attend class, if you feel sick and you're able but you, but you're feeling well enough to learn, right? Send me a message. If you're, don't come to class. If you're feeling sick, but you're like, eh, I've got the sniffles, but I think I can still learn and do work and I don't want to miss class, send me a message and I'll, and I'll set you up on Zoom, okay? No problem. Now, that's not to say that now, now I can't change the modality of my class. I can't make it hi, uh, you know, hybrid flexible. I can't say, oh, if you don't want to come, you, you don't have to come. I'm not allowed to say that. What I'm allowed to say is for the health and safety of everybody, if you are feeling sick, send me an email and I'll make sure Zoom. You know, uh, and I'll make sure you're on Zoom. I, as far as I can tell, getting boosted isn't a requirement. I've been boosted. I reacted to the booster much better than the second one. Um, so, okay. So again, um, now with masks, also I should just let you know, I am not going to play, I'm not, I, I'm not gonna play any games when it comes to masks, okay? It's very simple that my, my protocol is as follows. If you forget, a ma if you, if your mask comes down or you forget to wear it, I'll just remind you. If you are deciding to play games about this, it is follows. I will remind you that I do not play games. I will then proceed to take your picture, which I can get because you're not wearing a mask. And then I will cancel class and refer you to sanctions. I don't play games about this. Okay, wear your mask. <laughs> so uh, I will not play games. I will just simply go, I, I have five levels of escalation. I will start at one and immediately jump to five. I don't play games. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so, uh, so sorry, sorry to be, you know, brunt about it, but again, it's, it's a public health thing. It, we, uh, people like to say, you know, a lot of people downplay it like it's just the flu or just a cold. Has anybody actually had the flu or gotten a cold or am I the only one? Because these things are terrible. They're terrible for God's sake. <laughs> no, I've never had to have that, have had anything like that happen before. Oh yeah. I've had, I've had the flu before and it sucks. Oh man. Oh man. So, so, okay. Um, but again, feeling sick, just don't come to class, right? You got, and again, I, we'll play this by ear, but I'm super flexible in the way I can run this class uh, because digital native and all that, you know? Okay, so now let's get into today's exercise. Cold, RSV, by, by RSV you mean cold? That's that, uh, if, again, not a biologist here. All right, so yeah, long COVID is no joking matter. Uh, but not having a sense of taste or smell means you've got brain damage. That's that's not fun. So, um, so let's go ahead. I'm gonna drop you a link in. So now here, I'm over here. I'm gonna open up today's exercise. So every drop this to everybody in chat over here. So this is the exercise that we'll be working on today. So you can click on that link. It's also this link I just clicked on, um, which is input out, uh, compute output. Mm -hmm. It's again, right? You're just gonna keep dropping in chat. Hopefully everybody opens it up. Um, so we're going to learn about a skill that you haven't had to learn before, which is really big estimation is the best way to put it. Um, we're, we're going to do this by using by using Python to assist us to do this. But um, 
we don't really tend to do really big estimation. It's not a skill that's really taught, but it's a useful skill. Um, and it used to be like one of those dumb uh, interview questions that um, got asked at like Google and stuff or, or, um, or at Microsoft or other tech com companies, like why are mantle colors round? Because you can wheel it away because tons of reasons. But here, what we care about is, but these kinds of, what, but what questions am I kind of talking about? Well, questions like, how many gallons of water flow out of the delta of the Mississippi River every, uh, every hour? Or how many uh, houses can fit in the Empire State Building? Those kind of dumb questions. Uh, but those, but this, but the being able to come up with answers of that to that is not dumb, and no, nobody's expected to get correct answers like that. But the question is like, is how in the world do you go about like even answering that or getting to anything that could be considered an answer? Do, does it, do people understand what I'm saying? Like, how would you even begin to solve that problem? That's the code, and the reason. Sorry, that's the um, trick. And that's the reason it's here. Uh, I'm going to bring this up in a computer science class because computer science, it's really a lot about problem solving and learning how to problem solve. So we're going to start out with a pretty basic example here. All right. Um, so the idea here is, is that a lot of problems, basic problems we're going to learn about often just can be solved by basically doing this. Ask the user right for input, do some kind of computation, throw it in an output, all right? Here's a pattern for that. Like, um, so this one is one of those questions that is gonna give you a big number, but not necessarily like impossible. You can sit down and think about it. Enter a year and I'll tell you how many minutes that is, right? How many minutes are in, in a number of years? So we can save and run this pop-up over here. I don't know if you can see the pop-up. I'm gonna say three years, how many? minutes are in three years and we get the output and it says it is 1.5 million minutes. It's a lot of minutes. So how does it go about solving that problem? And you might notice if you've looked ahead that this is very similar to a problem you had to deal with in, in your lab, which is uh, given a number of seconds, how many, uh, how many hours and minutes and seconds is that, right? Like, so here we're asking how many years, if I, if, you, if I give you a number of years, can you tell me how many things, how many minutes that is? So let's go ahead and just read this code, okay? Also take a look at this thing. You got a little text box over here. Can't really stretch it out too far, but we can make do. So first thing we do is that we have the input statement. Enter a number of years and I'll tell you how many minutes that is. So the input function, right? Basically what that does is that it prints out a message and then it waits for the user. It prints out this string and it waits for the user to enter a string. That's what happened when we did this. Here in the web form, it just appears as this box. So I put in three and what it does, so whatever I put in, it stores that text in here. Now I could put in something other than text, like I could type in the word three, but as you can see, when I do that, it crashes and burns, right? Because I typed in the letters, because it doesn't identify, the computer doesn't understand that that is not T-H-R-E-E, -E, that's three. It just thinks it's letter, 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 letter. Don't know what to do with that, boss, sorry. Make sense? So what it does is it solves, it, it stores, whatever text you put in in here. This next line says, all right, if you put in some kind of nu numeral, like three, the num numeral three, I don't want that to be text anymore. I want that to be a number. That's what this function does. Int turns something into an integer. We have a bunch of functions that do stuff like that. For instance, uh, the int function turns things into integers, floats, turn things into floats, floating point numbers. And finally, str, which is short for string, that turns it into string, any, anything into a string. Okay, so now what this does is that it, now this line, again, sometimes it calls for confusion for people, but you remember that this is a 
two part process when you've got an assignment statement, this equal sign. We take what's on the right and store it on the left, store it in the left. So here we've got, oh yeah, you could totally do it in one line. You could totally do it in one line, but the author of the textbook, especially at this early phase, they like to break things down into, one, into multiple lines. Yes, I see your hand up. So when you put years equals input, and then you put years equals integer uh, int years, it doesn't cancel out the other um, fun like the other process that you did earlier. Because when nope. we, okay. It, it's sequential, it's sequential. So first you do this, then you do this. Int is the function that turns something into an integer. So here, uh, when I put in a number, right? Okay. I just got the string three. Hopefully that answer answers that question. Okay. Um, and now what this line does over here, line five. takes three. So this will take three, turn it into three. So you can, over, so what this does is that when we, when we do this function over here, this overwrites the value that was previously stored in here. That's what's going on here. Does that make sense? How does the computer know to like, pro, like once you, once it gives us the input, enter the number of years? Like, so are you saying once you enter that number, it stops listening to that input and it starts doing these other calculations below? Yes, it's all sequential. It's gonna finish one line before it does I anything see. else. It's so like, at first it's an input, but once you put the input, it'll change the meaning of yep. years later on. Yep. Well, I've, so, <laughs> so I, so what it's, so what I've done here is that I have, so when I hit save and run, when I run it, it calls input, which asks for input from the user. It then stores it in, it takes that and it then stores that in years. Okay, now that it's stored in years, we're saying, hey, take the thing in years and turn it into a num into an integer type, a type that it can use use it with. That's correct, Joshua. It doesn't realize that three is a number until I turn it into one. Um, Joshua, yes. Uh, you could put it all in one line and it would go in and it would do PEMDAS, which is that it would, that what's in parentheses would get executed first. So we could, we could shorten this. We could shorten this is what common question I've been getting in DMs into just doing this. But it essentially just turns that, that two lines into just one longer line where we ask for the input, it evaluates this and then it turns it in, yeah. And then it turns it into a number and then it stores that number in years. And yes, everything is a string all inputs are entered in strings. So it's always a string. If we get something that we think we can turn into a number, we do so, right? But if I try to enter something like Bob over here, it's gonna say, hey, I couldn't turn that in. I'm gonna just crash and burn. Um, and that's correct. I wouldn't be able to do two and a half years uh, here. If I did do two and a half years, let's see. I'd have to be using float in order to deal with that. Right, because it says invalid literal, literal being this thing over here. This is a literal, this is a literal, this is a literal, this is a variable, this is a variable, this is a variable, this is a literal. Literals are like literal pieces of text. They're like constants in your in your algebra. So uh, Peter, Peter Lai, I thought double allowed decimal. So this is coming from another programming language. So doubles is short for double, uh, double precision floating points. 
That's what double is short for. Float is short for floating point, which is typically in most, like in Java, that's a 32-bit floating point number. A double is a 64-bit floating point number. Python doesn't care about the difference, so it just goes with float because float is one letter shorter than a double. And, and double is a bit weird for, of a bit weird of a name if you think about it. All right. Yep, yeah, they're basically there. Floats and doubles are exactly the same thing. Uh, floats are exactly the same as doubles in other languages. So, um, so okay. So now let's now that we've got this, let's move on to the next part, which is let's change the above problem to print the number of seconds. So how would we go about changing this to print out the number of seconds instead of the number of minutes? Okay. Change minutes into seconds and then um, make it equal to hours. Well, we would want to add another line, I think. We, we could just simply go and skip it over here. But what we want is, yeah, just minutes times 60, right? right? We could do, we, we could ask ourselves, well, I mean, let's think about how they did this. They said, okay, we got our number of years. We can figure out how many days that is by multiplying years by 365, since that is the average amount of days in a year. We're going to get it, get to that in a later episode, uh, later episode, later lecture, uh, because uh, days are not there are not 365 days in a year. There's about 365 and slightly less than a quarter. <laughs> um, there are 24 hours in a day, and then there's uh, 60. Uh, minutes in an hour. So now we can go seconds is equal to minutes. Times 60. And now we'll just change over here. Seconds. So that's going to print out the variable. So with the print, this prints out the variable. And this prints out some text. And so now we're going to change this so it matches up. Assuming I can spell, again, got my PhD in computer science, not English, so, you're, so spelling errors will abound here. Um, so, oh, we didn't change that, so let's go ahead and change that. Tell, tell you how many seconds that is. Okay, so we can. So we can now change that, and let's say, let's do a, ye a single year. A single year is... Let's see, we don't print out commas, but 31 million seconds about. So we adjusted this. Now, two, part two is the trickier part, I feel, okay? Which is changing the part around. So give, given the problem and going in the other direction. So given the initial problem, which is this, can we go in the other direction? Which is given a number of seconds, how many year, uh, if we if we tell them to enter a number of seconds, how do we figure out the number of years? And this is uh, very conveniently very similar to your homework, where we're asking uh, how many, how many, uh, how many uh, hours our certain seconds are. Although I do it ask to break it down. So going the other way around, let's go ahead and just simply do. Yep seconds, input the number of seconds, seconds, and I'll tell you how many years that is. Okay, now we figured that out by doing multiplication initially, right? We, there, were six, there were 365 days in a year, so multiply the number of years by 365 to get the number of days. Make sense? Then we just did that for every unit below. Here, we're going to have to do division. Right? Uh, there are, so here, minutes. Oh, and I need to, right, do seconds, and I got to convert it. Right? So let's go ahead and do, and don't worry about my division operations. We'll mess with that in a bit. But uh, but seconds, so we want to move up to another time unit. Minutes is equal to seconds, 
divided by 60, right? If I've got 360 minutes, I can, sorry, 360 seconds, I can figure out how many minutes that is by dividing by 60. The number I chose very deliberately because, all right, mentally in your head, 360 divided by 60. Okay, they both end with zero, so I'm just going to chuck that out, chuck out those zeros. Now it's 36 divided by six, which you recognize from your times tables, which is six, six minutes, right? Um, again, if it's hard, the only math questions I ask are either easy or they're intended for, they're easy, they're trick questions, or I ask for the computer to do it, okay? Um, so minutes, seconds divided by 60. Uh, now let's do hours. How many minutes are in an hour? 60. Okay, how many, uh, how many hours are there in a day? There are 24 hours in a day. The spacing doesn't actually matter here, but that's, it's, I'm just trying to be consistent. And then years have, we can skip weeks and months and go straight to years. Uh, years, the solar year has about 365 days in it. So a years is equal to days divided by 360. So if I gave you uh, 730 days, Divide by 365, you get two years. So days divided by 365. And then print years. It or let's go with seconds. Seconds is years. Okay. And now if I do 31 0 0 0 0 0 0 0, lots of zeros. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> okay. 31. So 31 million seconds is about 0.98 years. Am I going to truncate that answer? And the answer is I can. If we want to find out how many whole numbers that is, we can do integer division at each point of this. Where basically I'm saying throw out all the remainders. So um Let's go with 32, zero. One, one, two, three. So, and I'll now say, and I'm gonna just simply change that to about, so. Change this to 32 to round up essentially. So we can go the other way. Um, and if you want it to be a floating point number, remember dividing here, we've got essentially three separate division operations that we do, okay? We have this division, which gives you a float, this division, which gives you integers, and then we have the related modulo operation, which we have to tra time travel all the way back to fourth grade for, right? Remember, modulo arithmetic gives you the remainder. So. Um, for instance, uh, 100, let's go ahead and do, so if I did 200 mod uh, three, that's basically asking what is the remainder of 200 after we've divided by three? What's the closest multiple to 200? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, this is a terrible example, um, but the, so let's see. 197, 190, 198 is a multiple of three. 198 is a multiple of three. How do I know that 198 is a multiple of three, by the way? Anyone? How do I know that 198 is a multiple of three? Just off the uh, The digits. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool little trick here. If the digits add up to a multiple of three, then the whole number is a multiple of three. Wait till you find out what the cool tricks I know about logarithms are because the way you've been taught logarithms are a bit silly. So anyway, so the answer to this would be about two, okay? So I'm gonna leave this part because that's your alone, alone because that's your homework, but we can see how we can basically take this out 
and break it down from from smaller units to bigger units. So let's go and move on to the problem. And I'm gonna and here's how it's gonna work, right? And this is the way a lot of in class exercises are gonna work, which is we'll go through the problem. I'll send you into the breakout room, okay? And then I'll see, and then we'll come back. And if you've had the answer, you can share it, or otherwise you can, uh, or otherwise you can just copy it down. This is for participation, right? This is essentially your participation grade, about 5% of your grade. Also, I can hit the share code button right here, and we'll share all the code that I've done. And you can just hit refresh on your page. Again, this is if you've logged into your account appropriately. You can just refresh your page and if you and it should show up in your history. So, and I'll and I'll very commonly do that, or when you do. So, um, so this is the next question to that we're gonna. So this is the question we're gonna work on today primarily. Okay, which is how many trees are in the state of Washington? Anybody from Washington here? The state of Washington, not not the District of Columbia. Cool. Uh, did you stay there much? Do you know, do you know, can you say anything about the quality of forest there? <laughs> right, so uh, yeah, a friend of mine likes to use it as an interview question. It may seem like an impossible question to answer, but has anyone ever gone out and counted them all? But uh, the exact answer is not problem solving. You can't like go and count every single tree. There's a lot of trees, by the way, it's a big number. Uh, but getting a ballpark is good. So you have to make some assumptions and some guesses. Like the first part to start with is like, you gotta gather some information. Like how much of the state of Washington is covered by trees? Like that's a good question to answer. Pretty easy to Google that. I mean, and that requires you to know. And then, then basically if it's covered by trees, if it's forest, how dense is that? And can I just ignore the trees planted in the city? Are there really that many? planted in the city and suburb? And the answer's like, yeah, not really negligible. Maybe add in a couple more percentage points. Um, to actually, to compute it, you have to make some assumptions and guesses. There's no correct answer to this. There are very much incorrect answers, but there's no correct answers. Uh, there's this fun post on uh, this XKCD blog, which is how, if all the data, digital data were stored on punch cards, how big would the warehouse be? Um, which is very similar in approach to this problem, by the way. Um, and Google, we don't necessarily know how big this was, and this was written a while ago, but there are a couple of organizations, only a couple organizations that probably hold more data than Google. Um, the NSA, the NRO, um, CIA, um, by the way, so NGA.mil you may know of, which, uh, but, um, We've got a couple of alphabet agencies, three letter agencies over here, nga.mil, um, probably doesn't like my VPN. Okay, um, but anybody know what the NRO is? Just off the top of their head. Um, and you only really know it if you're into conspiracy theories or really into military stuff. Um, it's not too, uh, too uncommon to not know about the NRO. Uh, Above and beyond the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, I believe they handle our 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 meaning the U.S.'s satellites and the data we get from satellites, which would explain why they deal with data. They were technically wait, isn't a, that like a CIA thing? Distinct from the CR, distinct from the CIA. Oh, okay. They are they are distinct from the CIA. They um because also the military has their own satellite and their own satellite stuff, but the NRO like. Like if you look on Wikipedia, they have a different mission kind of thing. Um, signal intelligence, satellite intelligence to government agencies. So um, they, there's a lot of, oh, there's overlap here, but it is, yeah, existence was first mentioned in 1971 and it was fine. And their existence of the NRO was class declassified in 92, 92. Okay, so it's been a lot. So they, they, they uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of organizations that you have probably not heard of that do stuff. But anyway, just fun thing that basically that they have a stuff. 
anyway, they compute basically that we can figure that out by the power consumption that uh, Google says they advertise. So that's how they figure it out. So the question is, how do we figure out how many trees are in the state of Washington? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just randomly yeet y'all into a bunch of uh, into a bunch of breakout rooms and see how and see uh, about you answering this question. Okay. So I'm just going to automatically throw people into breakout rooms because this is only going to be for 10 minutes. So so if you've got friends in the class, you know you'll have to live with being apart from them for a bit. So got yeah, 34. One more, actually, because some people may have just gone to sleep. That happens sometimes. Let's do 30. Assign automatically, create. So, well, so again, I'll, you can work on this and just try to like use the internet to compute. Like you don't want to use the internet to try to get an answer directly of how many trees are in the state of Washington, but more like try to figure out like how you can get to that answer, right? and how to do that, that kind of computation. And, and then I'll go through to how we can kind of figure that out ourselves when, when we get back. Make sense? Okay. All right. So pause share, say stop sharing and... Okay, let's just wait for people to get back in here. Okay, just waiting for the breakout rooms to close. Let's see, because we need to boot, because some people need to come back out. Let's see. I know that was a very like quick and hectic exercise and you either got a lot done or you didn't get a lot done. One of the two. It's perfectly fine. All right, so let's go ahead and share the screen again. Boom, good. Let's do this. Okay. So, how in the world do I? So, let's see. Does anybody want to actually uh, share their answer or come forward with uh, the process they used? Yeah, go ahead. Feel free to unmute yourself or do whatever you need to do. Screen sharing is still enabled if you want to share your screen. Oh, I think. I think you have to stop sharing first. Ah, yes, because I'm the host and you can't, <clears throat> and you can't take over. <laughs> yes, let me go ahead and lower hand. Okay. So I don't know, I have a pretty decent at, at math. So what I uh, came to was started with how many square miles was in Washington. Right. Then I looked at the percent that was covered by forest. And I added a small percentage for say, like you said, for trees in the city, but you could change that. Yeah. And now how did you get your 0.574, by the way? 0.015. That was just pure, pure no, the, the 0.5274 for how- uh, I Googled it. So if you look- So if you um, Google, so if you Google was the tree density, right. So, so the percent covered by trees works for me and then i found um you know then how many acres square mile were, because yeah, so then you... i found this um oh, wrong <laughs> sorry no worries i'm sure you weren't expecting to come in and present to class today that's fine and then uh the trees per acre so then i just converted um square miles into acres and then acres by trees per acre so then I just did a little, this crazy number here. <laughs> yeah, which if I just go ahead and annotate with some commas over here, which is about, which says basically a billion and a half trees. Right, it's a large well, number. Large number, hard for us to say. I mean, they, that, that sounds like how, a billion. Well, our puny human minds can't really deal with numbers like that. It's a bit hard for us to understand uh, numbers bigger than a hundred essentially. Right. But that looks about right. 
by the way, that, or that, or at least the, uh, the, um, the break, the problem, the breakdown of the problem is the correct way to do it or one of the many correct ways to do it. Right. There's Are definitely you, more than one way. Mm-hmm. There's definitely more than one way. Does anybody else want to share their answer? It's, it's fine if you don't, or you can just, if you don't want to share, you can also like briefly just kind of say what your problem solving process was if you want to share. Perfectly fine if you do. It's fine if you don't. Yes, Josh. Uh, I can't share mine because I'm using Zoom on a Mac and doing this on my desktop. Uh-huh. But uh, the basic process I did was I found the number of acres in Washington, mm-hmm. the number of acres that take up trees in Washington. And then I like Washington was just so I could state how many trees are in that square mile or acre. Mm-hmm. And then for the math, I took the average amount of trees that could fit in an acre. Uh-huh. So what it looked like was uh, it took number of acres, which is 22 million. And I times that by 435, which was the average number of trees per acre to get that rather large number. So somewhere in the tens of billions for you. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, Maya, I did see your hand up for a bit. Did you want to jump in? Um, yeah, I could. I didn't really do a lot of math, though. It was just like I looked up a lot of facts and just made assumptions. That's a good place to start. What facts yeah. did you use? So I looked up how many trees exist like in the whole world. Oh, well, that's a good way to do that. Yeah. So it was like three, three trillion, three trillion trees. And then um, I looked up like the, like the geography of Washington. Um, and, um, I was looking up like I got distracted. So I looked up mountains and um, how many like what types of trees exist in Washington and then what trees exist like growing on mountains and like Douglas firs were one of them. So then I was like, OK, there's a lot of mountains. <laughs> with trees in Washington and there's a lot of mountains. And then I, I did look up acres, but I didn't go anywhere with it. So then I just made the assumption on like, it must be at least like 40% of the land. So I was like, okay, if there's 3 trillion trees, maybe it's like a hundred million trees, like just going off of that. Yeah. It's not, the way you approached it wasn't a bad way, especially saying, I don't know how much Washington is, but you're like 40%. That's just, you know, that's 10 percentage points off around from the actual answer. That's going to get you close if you actually use that, which is good. Um, but starting from, but yeah, that's another way to do it, which is figure out how much, uh, like that's another like really cool back of the envelope calculation, which we could lead off of that, which is how many trees are there in the world? What percent of the land mass area does, uh, does, um, does Washington take up and then just simply, you know, uh, multiply by that percentage and you get it. Let's see. I got a DM saying we did a similar process of finding acres of land covered in, covered in forest in Washington and then multiplied them by the average number of trees of forested land getting one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm just counting the zeros. 1.1 billion. So we get a lot of answers in the billion to tens of billion range. It's pretty, you know, that's an order of magnitude off, but I mean, like, that's pretty good for our, our kind of thing, you know, that we're trying to do here. And that's about what I would try to do, which is like figure out the square acre of Washington. And I'm not, unfortunately, I feel a bit pressed for time, so I'm not going to be able to do it on my screen. So, um, so if you need to, you can try it yourself later uh, or refer back to this recording. Uh, but again, what it is is that, um, is that basically we use the percentage of uh, of uh, what I would do, or the way I was thinking approach this is like figure out how much what the percentage is very much like Mike's answer was, which is figure out the percentage of land and that is forest. Okay, how much forest is uh, it, how many acres of forest are there, and then how many trees per acre in forest. And then add a couple more for the cities and suburbs. Like, so maybe increase the percentage up by a couple points to figure out how many total trees there are. Um, it's, 
it's so we've got a very interesting range. Um, and if we do Google how many trees, how many trees in Washington state, uh, the federal government estimates about 9.4. So if you're in within in the billions of range, you're pretty much got into the uh, right answer, which is pretty cool. Um, and that's based on average forest density, they're saying. So it's, it's a lot of trees, a lot, a lot of trees. It's kind of inconceivably weird. Uh, and it's a good thing they don't move up. Otherwise we'd be seriously outnumbered and, uh, and outgunned. <laughs> Revenge for all the paper. All right, so let's go back to uh, this one. How many handshakes? So how many handshakes would it take for everyone in the class to shake hands with everybody else? Uh, assu assuming, you know, we didn't have to worry about coronavirus anymore. Uh, you don't wanna shake hands with the same person twice and you don't shake your own hand, right? So this is another kind of problem. The answer here is that we start small. What if their class is only two people? How many handshakes would take place in that case, right? We've got two people, how many handshakes would take place? One. Hey, I've got some. Yep. And if I've got, uh, if I've got three people, how many handshakes would I get? Four. Four. Um, let's see. One. Alice and Bob would shake hands. Okay. Uh, Carl and. Bob and Carl would shake hands. And then Alice and Carl would shake hands. So, right, you've got three people, right? You've got three people, A, Alice, Bob, and Carl. They need to shake hands. They need to shake hands. They need to shake hands. So that's three, right? Um, so three gives us three. So Six. Yeah, so four, four, so four. By the way, if you can fig figure out, awesome way to do this. So Alice, Bob, Carl, and Dan. Alice and Bob, by the way, those are your common meta syntactic variable for names. So Alice, Bob, Carl, and now we need to add one more edge for everybody else. So we just added three lines. So four people, we added three more, which gave us six. Uh, so if I've got five, and I'm just going to kind of belabor the point here. Uh, let's see, we've got five. So I need to, so let's go with Edward. Edward needs one, two, three, four lines added, right? Because he's, we've just introduced Edward to the class and we need to add four people, which gives us a grand total of, of 10. Um, so using this pattern, anybody can, can anybody project what the next number is? Six gives us, uh, gives us, and, yep, 15. Because Frederick F would have to shake hands with the five people. So we'd add five. The next person we'd add six people, which would be, give us 21. So we've got kind, so, the question is, what in the world is this formula, right? I recognize this formula because I deal with this formula all the freaking time. Uh, you know, you don't, um, but I recognize this series of numbers. Um, um, and it becomes easier once I, once I, again, drawing it out makes everything easier, but I recognize this kind of series of numbers. Total of one. Then two, yes, Ryan's got it. Two. Then six num one. Then three. Then six. Then ten. Then fifteen. And then twenty one. And, it, and as I add each 
as as I add, right, I'm adding another layer below, and I just happen to be putting it in the form of a triangle over here. If I, if I was doing it with text and not my terrible handwriting, it would look something like this, which is uh, star, 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 um, so this is what's called a triangular number series, by the way, just for, for in case you, you might have touched it in mathematics at some point, but it's got this kind of stuff. So <laughs> like Super Mario, yes, actually, we'll be dealing with this in Mario. We, we deal with this in runtime a whole lot. So we've got, I'm not sure what you mean by tree logic, but I mean, there is, uh, but in the sense that like if you had, Let's see, I'm not sure quite if it would quite line up with binary search trees because you don't have enough children. But the, oh, I'm, no, no, Daniel, it's not a pyramid scheme. It's a reverse funnel. <laughs> um, so, sorry. I just couldn't resist. All right, so the, idea here is that this is what we call a, tri a triangular number series. So the question is, what is kind of the formula that we need? And we got an answer here that we did that that wasn't that's useful, but at the same time, a bit beyond what we can do with programming, which is that, uh, let's see, and we might have to adjust the formula, which was this, right, which is n plus, so this was um, the, this formula for triangular numbers in general is that is that you've got sigma because I can't do Greek because I don't have the Greek off my hand right now, which is uh, sigma of n from one to n is equal to this, right? We just normally see it see it flipped around, right? So what we see here is essentially what this is saying is that let's and let's see if this fits in. So if I put in three, three plus two plus one. So I'm not quite getting it. So really what we're dealing with here is sigma. If we've got n, we want to start with n minus one with the because because we're not shaking our this would apply if we were shaking ourselves, but what we need here is n minus one. Here we go. That is the equation, Joshua. Yes. Um, I did mention triangular numbers. So, I mean, tri triangular numbers, right? And you'll see that this comes down to n times n plus one over two. And so, yes, the equation we need we'll find is actually, this is our pattern. Now you'll be seeing this pattern, either this formula, which is, let's see, which is either this or depending on, on what the value of N is, basically whether or not you shake your own hand or not, right? So what we can do is now we can say input. Um, how many people is equal to? And I know I kind of just went from from A to point uh, C without sorry from A to D without pe with uh, and it feels like people may have dropped off from B and C. That's fine. Uh, uh, N int n is n, get that input, right? Turn it into a number. And now let's go ahead and compute, right? We need that nth person to shake n minus one, and then n, he needs to shake n minus one people's hands. And then those remaining n minus, so what, how does that work? Well, we've got n people. Let's take person number n. 
that person has to shake n minus one people's hands, right? Right, he has n other, minus one people's other hands to, uh, to, to, um, to, oh, you're right, it's not plus, it's n, my bad. Just copy paste without checking. Can we use a while loop for this? Um, yeah, but we're trying to do it without a loop. Okay. I'm just trying to, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm kind of just giving you the formula so that we don't have to use a loop right now. Loops come later. So, so the nth person, they have to, so we take the nth person, nobody's shaking hands yet. We take person number n, he shakes hands with n minus one people, make sense? Now we have n minus one people remaining who haven't shaken hands. We take the n minus one person and they have to shake hands with n minus two people because, right, he's already shaken person with hands with Alice. So this person, Bob, has to shake hands with Carl and Dan and Edward and Fred and George and so on and so forth, okay? Then Carl, n minus two, they have to sh shake hands with n minus three people and so on and so forth until we get to the last person and they don't have to shake hands with anybody else, right? So it would be n minus two, one plus n minus two plus n minus three plus n minus four. Now, if we were starting at n, so the formula for this is typically it's n plus, you know, it's n, it's one plus, sorry, it was n plus n minus one plus n minus two with parentheses and so on and so forth. Um, dot, 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 plus one, right? That's typically the way this would work. That's typically the formula for it, for these kinds of situations. But because again, every, every we're not shaking our own hand, right? If everybody shook, shook their own hand, we'd have this extra N here. But the nth person, Alice, has to shake N minus one, N minus one has to shake A minus two, and so on and so forth. So we remove this N. Now, this normally, okay, this normally is this. Okay, normally that is this. But since we're not doing that, but since, uh, but since we are not doing this nth person, our formula becomes this, and we need to transform it into the more appropriate uh, statement, which is, well, we subtract, instead of starting from n, we go to n minus one. Yeah, there's not, we're making sure that nobody, nobody gets left out on the handshaking. So this becomes, instead of being n, and so basically we replace all the n's with n minus one. So n minus one becomes n minus two n becomes n minus one, and so on and so forth. So all the n's become n minus one, this becomes n minus one, and this becomes n, and we just simply rewrite that to n, minus n, n times n minus one, which looks a bit better. So now we can just print that out, print n times n minus one divided by two, save and run. So if we've got a class 150 people registered for it, we need to do 11,175 handshakes would to actually take place here. Now, this is a bit of a harder one because this actually gets into a specific subject. Somebody says, said, wow, lucky I, lucky I took statistics today. Uh, what it specifically is this subdomain, by the way, when we're counting like this? What is this mathematics subdomain that we're working in? not specifically statistics or probability, but this is a specific subdomain of that, which is counting the number of things. Summation is more of the technique. This is a, it's not a bad term though. Combinatorics. Which is fine if you have no idea what that is. It's, um, this is that subject area, which is just counting things. 
uh, and and counting how often things happen. You you think that counting wouldn't deserve its own <laughs> own branch of mathematics, but it does. It's it's kind of funny that 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 does. Um, but basically, in other words, because counting, you know, these sequences, it, it, it figures out all these kind of sequences, and it uh, yeah, frequently used in computer science to obtain formulas and estimates in the analysis of algorithms. Um, and if you are going to take them, and, and I'll just say this for mathematics. Um, mathematics, we typically consider that to be boring. Like, look at this. Oh, triangular numbers. That's boring. We're going to learn that mathematics ain't boring later on. Specifically, there's one branch of mathematics that's very exciting, and that is statistics. Why? Because statistics did not get its start in mathematics like everything else did. It did not come up with some guy who was just like, oh, I wonder what the odds of this are happening are. No, it's like, uh, I need to pay my debts. I want to go get uh, my gambling debts. How can I win more money at gambling so I can pay my gambling debts? That's an exciting story. Uh, so statistics were considered kind of lowbrow for our mathematicians because what was the use of it? It was gambling. <laughs> and so, uh, so, um, so st statistics, now to tie it back into, so statistics are pretty good for figuring out your, like your odds are winning, but more importantly, your odds of being scammed at certain games. Um, and we, there's a very good study amount of that. So for our, my last question of the day, oh, and let me share that code with everybody that I did so that you can use it. What is the one uh, game what game at uh, a casino does the player have the advantage? Blackjack. Blackjack. Blackjack has a slight advantage because just of the way the statistics and the rules are set up. How do you figure that out? Again, statistical analysis. We're going to learn later on how to do these statistics, but not in the boring kind of math way, but in the more exciting kind of uh, I don't know how to figure out these statistics, so I'm just going to run this game millions of times. <laughs> Roulette, I think, would be, I forget. It's like worse. The, I think there's some, some, I think there's some place, spaces in Roulette where everything breaks, where, where you just can't win. Yeah, Roulette's like the worst odds. That's when Einstein said the only way to win at Roulette is to steal money off the table when the dealer's not looking. That's not a bad strategy. Um, but um, but blackjack works because of the deal, because specifically because of the dealer's rules and the way the dealer works, and because you can do card counting to help mitigate that. That's where it really flips. All right. So, it, and and th well, this will come back later when we start talking about Monte Carlo approximations, which sounds really complicated. But I assure you, it's actually just basically doing math the really lazy way. Okay. Um. So. I've shared the code for you. Go ahead and run it. Be sure to end. So be sure to just run your uh, these things over here. I do like to start things and go, OK, easy explainer, then, then basically progressively get deeper. It's OK if you get lost. And if you need help, please reach out to me. I'm willing to meet with you. Um, class is dismissed, by the way. Um, if you need to stay behind and talk to me, ask me questions, want to, do, uh, uh, want to demo something, I'm willing to stay behind for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Nicholas.